So fingolimod is, is a modulator of the sphincter one phosphate receptor, and it modulates S1, P1, 3, 4, and 5. We have a next generation coming in now, which are more specific, S1, P1, with a little bit of 5, sometimes 3, but, but more specific. And the first one that's been approved is an agent called saponimod. Want to talk a little bit about where we are with that? Yeah, so it, it is one of the more selective S1P receptor 1 and 5 um, uh, modulators. Uh, it was uh, studied in the phase 3 EXPAND trial, which was a secondary progressive MS trial of uh, saponimod versus placebo. Uh, the patient population was a pretty typical secondary progressive MS uh, population. Uh, this was an event-driven trial, so an interesting design, not uh, fixed time duration for each patient, but basically calculating in advance the number of events that one would need to achieve, assuming a certain difference between the active versus the placebo. And once that number of events was achieved, uh, basically the trial was uh, stopped and analyzed. And um, siponimod uh, was superior to placebo uh, in, in the primary outcome measure, which was confirmed disability progression at 12 weeks, a modest but statistically significant uh, benefit, and also impacted uh, favorably multiple um, uh, MRI measures of uh, focal inflammatory disease activity, what one thinks of as, uh, as relapse biology. And uh, you pointed out to the fairly broad label, which uh, I think reflects the FDA's uh, recognition that the relapse biology is one that exists throughout the spectrum, or at least a broad range of the MS spectrum, starting from CIS and through to patients with uh, active SPMS, although with the, uh, I agree with the concerns you have about that uh, uh, less than uh, clear definition of, of activity in SPMS. Well, also, it's a little unusual here to have a drug that was tested in, in a very different population, just what you said, a very well-characterized secondary progressive population, but average mean EDSS, I think, was 5. 4.7, yeah. You know, and, and it was just a very different population. Um, so I'm just not quite sure what it meant, you know, to cut out the group that they used a different activity, but one could look at activity in multiple different ways. They looked at it because it was part of the study as individuals who had no clinical activity for the two years prior. They didn't look at radiographic activity, and they didn't look at people who had activity on study, which was a different group than the group that had activity going in two years. So I'm just not sure what you do with that information as opposed to taking the study as a whole. You're referring to the FDA didn't look yes. at that, yeah. Because the study, of course, did look at that. Uh, because One of the questions going in, uh, pre-planned analysis, was is the effect, the benefit of saponimod versus placebo on limiting uh, progression of disability driven by the effect on relapse biology and accumulation of disability that's uh, relapse driven. And so they looked both at leading into the study, the, the degree of disease activity, as well as on study. And in both cases, although one gets into subgroups and, and decreases the power, of course, at least the point estimates all seem to be um, favoring the saponimod, uh, including in the groups that didn't have overt clinical relapse activity. Um, a caveat, of course, is that, as you pointed out, uh, activity uh, measured by relapses only is not going to sensitively pick up uh, subclinical relapse disease biology that could, of course, be impacted and would be expected to be impacted by this class of drugs. It also troubles me, in principle, that this trial was designed to look at secondary progressive MS. It was a successful trial. It met its primary endpoint, and yet the FDA didn't approve it in that way and instead cut up the data and approved it for subgroup, including groups in which it was never studied, like CIS. We can assume that the drug is likely to be effective there, but I, I do think it's hard to sit down with a patient and explain to her why saponimod is an option for her at the time of her CIS when you look at the data and it was just studied at the entire opposite end of the, the disease spectrum. I think that poses a real conundrum for us, and, and it concerns me that it might be a disincentive for other companies to pursue progressive MS trials if even a successful clinical trial uh, it doesn't lead to regulatory approval. It may be. As, as you know, all the other companies were invited by the FDA to sort of extend their labels into, uh, in, into the earlier. I, I think that um, it is a conundrum, and, and particularly this issue of an SPMS population, and it's not approved for, for SPMS without obvious activity, although the 
substantial element of the benefit appeared to be in those who did have that relapse biology. And in some ways, you know, we've been encouraging the FDA to accept our view that there's all this subclinical relapse biology and that it is present throughout the spectrum of MS. So in some ways, they've moved one step closer, perhaps, to, to the, con the totally conceptual I think it was a real step forward recognizing some of the things that you've published, Fred. Uh, and if you look at the population, the average age was in the late 40s. These are people who had secondary progressive MS or 13 years since uh, duration of diagnosis and only three years since they had SPMS. These are not the vast majority of patients that, that I'm seeing with progressive MS who are late 50s and 60s. And I worry about whether the risk benefit is necessarily in favor of treating all of those patients. However, uh, the label might be a blessing in, in, in uh, disguise because the S1P receptors penetrate into the CNS. So they have the possibility to have a direct effect on neurodegeneration. If saponamide has a direct effect on neurodegeneration, why wouldn't it be the S1P receptor to use in CIS and early relapsing MS where there is neurodegeneration? I mean, that would be very logical to me. Okay. At least on the one hand, it doesn't say what you do with the secondary progressors without activity, and which what, is still and what an, unmet, frame. Un, and what, an unmet need for us. They should have gotten a label for SPMS, period. Not active versus not active, I think, based on their trial. Or at least to include imaging metrics of, of activity. Yeah, but I must say, they, you know, I think it was a, a very successful trial in the sense of the recruitment population. Mm -hmm. You know, they really did get a, a group, and even three years after if you think of that, you said three years after declaring, but it takes like three to four to five years before you really right. declare someone secondary progressive MS. I, I've always thought that's one of the big challenges and why others have failed in secondary progressive MS because as opposed to even the primary progressive MS, they have this 13, 14, 15 year duration of disease. So a lot has gone on that, that we're not impacting very well.